This is a lecture for an upper level undergraduate history of ancient Roman course. According to ancient Roman historian Cassius Dio, Marcus Aurelius was fighting a German tribe called the Quadi in the Marcomanni War. The overheated and thirsty Romans, who were linked together by their shields, were surrounded and besieged by the tribe. A prefect told Marcus about a legion of Christians from Melitene of the Cappadocia province who could pray and accomplish anything. So Marcus had them pray. Suddenly, dark clouds began to form over the Roman soldiers' heads and rain poured down only on the Romans. The soldiers used their helmets and opened their mouths to drink the water. The Quadri tribe experienced the surprise storm differently. They became pelted with hailstones among the thundering booms and the lightning bursts. Fires erupted on the ground from the lightning's detonating energy. Between the Quadri's thirst and the burning of their flesh, those who could flee did so into the arms of the Roman soldiers and their swords. The Christian soldiers were the 12th legion until this event. According to, Marcus, sorry, according to Cassius Dio, Marcus ordered the legion to be called Thundering Legion. But Marcus also ordered a change in the persecution of Christians at the same time. He said, quote, And I counsel that no such person be accused on the ground of his being a Christian. And I further desire that he who is entrusted with the government of the province shall not compel the Christian who confesses and certifies, certifies such a matter to retract. Neither shall he commit him. In other words, Marcus Aurelius was rolling back all the laws of Hadrian, Trajan, and Nero, who persecuted Christians in their name only and for their beliefs, which did go to worshiping idols or worshiping the Roman gods specifically. So despite the, the decree, Marcus Aurelius's reign demonstrates the complexity between Roman and Christianity. The time under Marcus Aurelius is second in the number of Christian martyrs, second to Diocletian's great persecution, which will come a little bit later. When Marcus Aurelius became emperor in 161 AD, he had to prove the gods favored him. The reign victory was a start, but after a while, that wore off. Marcus had to find other ways of connecting people's religious fervor with his reign. He started by putting, quote, religio, showing respect for the gods, on coinage. He also started putting, quote, superstitio, which was fear of the gods, on document stamps. Tertullian said Romans, quote, were more sincerely afraid and circumspect in their devotions to Caesar than to Olympian Jove. He was undoubtedly correct when the column of Marcus Aurelius was built to honor his reign. Scene 16 shows the reign victory. It has a deity over the Roman soldiers who are getting covered with water flowing from the deity's arms. There is calm on the soldiers' faces while their enemy, the Quadi, lay dead with their <laughs> horses. The deity is not affiliated with any specific religion because the goal was for people to see their god in the scene, which fits with Rome's pantheism of recognized and accepted religions that Marcus pandered, especially since his reign was full of calamities. One such calamity, returning Roman soldiers from Seleucia brought a plague. 
killing one third of the population within the entire empire, not just Rome, empire. That's a lot of people. At the same time as this plague was running through not just the military, but the population, the Germans decided to strike in an attempt to recover the provinces of Raetia, Noricum, and Pannonia. So with the military decimated, almost, Marcus faced significant loss. He had to turn to recruiting gladiators and slaves to fight the Germans. This had not been done in over 300 years. The last time was during the Second Punic War when Hannibal Barca was, had roamed Italian peninsula for 15 years. At this time, Marcus Aurelius' reign had not lasted 15 years. So for him to go to such, a strength, such drastic measures in such a short amount of time, this struck fear into the hearts of the Romans. And as most people do when disaster strikes also, they look for people to blame. They did it under Nero with the great fire of Rome. And in Rome, as in that time, that disasters and blame went hand in hand with the Christians. But it went to more than that, than just scapegoats and finding someone to blame. Romans believed that gods protected them from tragedies and they protected the empire so when they occurred Romans thought that the gods no longer favored Rome and the Romans since Christians worshipped one true God it they did not worship the Roman gods which offended the Roman gods that was the Roman thinking so Christians were offending the gods who left Rome open to misfortune. Tertullian expressed the people's sentiment when disaster befell Rome. Cries could be heard, quote, away with these Christians to the lions. Well, feeding Christians to the lions and other beasts became a familiar spectacle in Lyon during Marcus's reign. A fragment of Senate, meeting, Senate minutes show a decree that allowed prisoners, instead of gladiators, because they were too expensive, to be used in ceremonial festivities that involved human sacrifice. Even though the minutes only talk of prisoners, Christians became the main sacrificial lambs due to the lack of other type of criminals. Also, the authorities arrested Christians more often and easier than other criminals because of the, most Christians were arrested under shameful acts, such as incest, which was a misunderstanding of the brotherly, sisterly, in Christ relationship, and cannibalism, again, a misunderstanding of the communion. Inside the arena, the Christians were tortured, beaten, and made examples of, aside from the original, uh, the religious sacrifice. The authorities used the arena to demonstrate their power. But the Christians used the arena to exhibit their faith to God and their fellow Christians. Also, to witness to their fellow pagan viewers. For example, a slave named Blandina was tortured, thrown to the beast, 
and finally beaten to death. Her execution took a long time. Many in the pagan audience began to pity her because they had not seen anyone endure so much for so long. In addition to the demonstration of faith, Christians were able to witness to the crowd verbally. And when interrogated publicly, they could defend and shed light of the gospel. Some apologists, like Tertullian, heralded Marcus Aurelius because he was the first to renounce the use of the name Christian to convict people and forbade the forcing of denials. Nonetheless, keeping the emperor's job meant that Marcus had to show the people the gods chose him to be emperor. While the reign victory helped Marcus to become emperor, he had to feather in the Roman gods to keep his job or risk being overthrown. And by this time, the Praetorian Guard had overthrowing emperors and replacing them with their own, whichever one they chose. They had that one down to, pat, to a good pattern. The combination of the plague and the attacks and just the reaction, the natural reaction of the Romans to have scapegoats and to look for the Christians to blame enlarged the number of Christian martyrs. But Rome did not get rid of Christianity as evidenced today because Rome did not have enough control over its provinces to either prevent or cause universal persecution. Rome had other matters to contend with, such as wars, disasters, and an expanding territory. So their resources were spread thinner as the territory expanded. Throughout the time of the Roman Empire, Christianity survived and grew because people became more sympathetic, as in with Blandina's case. Christians understood that Jesus Christ died for them. Therefore, they went willingly to give their lives for him.